Hello, everyone. This is Professor Jeff Wilkerson at Luther College, talking to you about giving you an introduction to Exercise 24 about Supernova 1987A uh, from Astronomers as Observers and Experimenters, published by Kendall Hunt, a uh, book, a collection of laboratory exercises in astronomy for uh, largely for non science majors, but certainly can be adapted for. Uh, astronomy majors or physics majors otherwise. Um, so anyway, we're going to talk about this, just give a little bit of an introduction to this activity exercise 24 uh, about supernova 1987A. And so in this, this exercise, if you've, if you've been doing some exercises from this lab book, and I hope you have, then um, you'll find, you know that we're really trying to build this around learning goals, around what outcomes we want to try to achieve and thinking about how each exercise can help us to achieve those outcomes. And there's a lot of different ways you could go with this particular exercise to think about what you want to do. So it's possible that you just want to take a detailed look at a supernova. And 1987A is a great one to do that. It was the first one in a long time that had been. It was the closest one in, in hundreds of years at the time that it exploded and that we had really good information and really good data for this supernova. So we get a good light curve. And this, um, this light curve uh, then can be plotted. You can look for the shapes. You can look for the peak. Uh, of the light curve and see what it looks like near peak, see how fast it fades afterwards, and just try to understand one supernova in detail that way. Uh, it's also possible to think about this just in a pure data analysis kind of, uh, kind of approach. How do you take a data set and how do you use that data set to learn something from it? So where do you look for? For example, one of the things I suggest to do in this exercise is to look for um, so it, you, there's a lot of data. Let's just start right there. There's a lot of data out there, and with a lot of data out there, uh, take the dates of the observations, even though they might have happened, you know, this was, uh, we'll start there and say that the data that you have, um, I took from the American Association of Variable Star Observers. I read there, their, I, I sort of processed the data that was in there, smoothed it out, averaged a bunch of points, and gave you the data that's out there in the table that you see. And so that comes from aavso.org. Check them out. Uh, it's a great organization. I'm a member of that organization. And if, if you want to be, if you're interested in doing projects and you're interested in doing a little bit of astronomy work and, and contributing to ongoing projects, uh, becoming a member doesn't cost very much. Becoming a member of aavso and, and looking at all the data that they have archived there and helping out with projects would be a fantastic way to go about doing that. So that data, so I, I averaged a whole bunch of observations from one day, uh, sort of did a comparative analysis for some of those observations and, and, and processed it through and smoothed it in a way to say, you know, for example, there were some, and it's, you know, we can go into details here. So this is one of the learning goals. We're getting right now to one of the learning goals is how do you take somebody else's data? How do you take a big data set and start to mine it, start to look for something that's of interest to you? And there are, there's a lot we could do here um, if we wanted to go into detail. We could blow that up into an entire semester course in, a, in and of itself. What are we going to do with big data sets in astronomy and how we're going to process those things through? Uh, not really the focus of, of what you, you probably want is if you're using this textbook. So, But still, the idea is to say, when I looked at that and I see there's, there's nine observations on one night, and with the nine observations on one night, all of them may have been clustered, eight of them may have been clustered around, say, magnitude 7.3, and then there's one that's magnitude 2.1. Now, probably that magnitude 2.1 uh, observation can be tossed out, and there are actual technical ways to decide whether you want to eliminate a, a data point from a data set to say this one observation is incongruent with the rest of the observations, so let's get rid of it and we'll, we'll, we'll apply this method for getting rid of that. And we, we could explore that. Um, but and so that's one of the things is to say, are you are you really comfortable with with this, you know, this data? You really shouldn't just throw data away. But in a, in a big data set like this, my guess is that those were transcription errors. My guess is that those weren't actual measurements. Somebody didn't go out and measure this supernova to be 100 times brighter than everybody else measured it to be on that night that they just sat down at the computer to enter this data into this big, long file. 
and it just the number got put in wrong. And that's my guess. Uh, but I don't know. And you never know with a data set like this. That's the trick. That's the beauty and the trick. So this is you know, a citizen science organization. Lots of people contributed to this data set. It's beautiful. Uh, it's a rich data set. It, it's, it's one of the wonders of, of, of science that we have these kinds of things around right now with lots of data in there. And we'd never, you know, we just wouldn't have this wealth of observations without the AAVSO doing that kind of work for us. Uh, but occasionally, when you have a whole bunch of people doing a whole bunch of things, things slip through that way where you got these these glitches, and we need to think about how to process that. So that's just, so so I massaged this data a little bit. Uh, I don't think I think I did so in a fair way, uh, and so I, I don't think I, I don't think I was dishonest in any way about getting rid of points that I didn't like or whatever. I did select knights. You know the not you'll notice that the knights aren't evenly sampled in the data table that I gave you. Uh, they're not, it's not every two weeks or something like that. So early on, uh, at the beginning, when the supernova first exploded, there were a lot of observations. People got tired. People gave up a little bit and stopped observing. And later on, uh, there weren't very many observations. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to average a bunch of observations. The more you have, the less a single outlier is going to, going to move that around. I call that the, the tail wagging the dog effect. If you've got one outlier, it can really shift especially if you're doing a, a curve fit to something, it can really shift what's going on right there um, if it's out on the tails, if it's out on the ends. Um, and so we got to be careful about stuff like that. So you want a lot, as much data in there as you can. But early on in the observation, I was actually looking for nice and didn't have quite as much data. So there wasn't quite as much to pour through and make sure that they all look good and, and process through in that kind of way. So early on, I, had, I was looking for nice and had a fewer observations. Later on in the data set, after the supernova got to be a year old, uh, then I was looking for nights that had more, more observations, because a lot of nights had one or two or three, and that's not enough to do an average and get and be really confident, especially we're using, in this data set, we're using the standard error, uh, the standard deviation usually denoted by sigma, the, the, divided by the square root of the number of observations, and there's what we often would do, we might play with that if it's a small number, like we're talking about here. Um, but in any event, uh, that's our standard. That's what we're using for the uncertainty that's, that's published in the in the book. And that uncertainty, um, you know, you, you need more observations to get that uncertainty down just a little bit. And this is only an approximation. As we talk about in the text, this is only approximation of the uncertainty. If you if you make three measurements uh, or four measurements and they're all exactly the same, that would imply that there's no uncertainty. The sigma is going to be zero. The standard deviation is going to be zero. Applies. There's no uncertainty. We know there's uncertainty in that data. So you take this. Anytime you see an error bar, anytime you see an uncertainty, take it with a grain of salt. You can explore these error bars as much or as little as you like. So this is a, again, this is a flexible exercise that you can go as far or as as little as you want. You can just ignore those error bars. If you don't want to mess with those error bars, just ignore them. Ignore those uncertainties. If you want to look at the uncertainties and see how the uncertainty vary as a function of time. Uh, over over the whole supernova and sort of explore this as an observational thing to think about the quality of the data set is great. If you want to look for individual nights, if you if you practice these statistics and you actually know your statistics well enough to think about something like 95% confidence intervals or whatever, and you want to look for individual nights in our data set that are um, not uh, that, that, are, that are statistically meaningfully different from what you would expect from a smooth curve, uh, you could say, ah, this point, this one night, or there's three nights right here uh, in, in a row, three observations in a row. They're not consecutive nights the way we plotted, but there's three observations in a row that are all high. Maybe something went on that caused the supernova to get brighter slightly for a few days. And that, that's the kind of exploration you could do if you wanted to explore the statistics or you could ignore it all together. So what you want to do is you want to plot the data. That's, that's the data that's in there. You plot the data. Uh, I've, I've given you the date of the of the data. That's where we started this whole long rambling uh, sidetrack on uh, the AABSO and statistics. But I've given you uh, the date. Now, some of those observations might have occurred earlier in the night, later in the night. So that's an average. There's an uncertainty in, in that right as well. Uh, if there's a lot of data, they probably span the, the darkness hours pretty well. Uh, but you don't know. I, I don't actually know what part of the globe those came from. You know, I, I so I can't say when within that date uh, these these observations actually occurred. We just average them out and we say, um, OK, plot the day along here. Just call the first observation day one. And then add up the number of days that come after that. And you have the day that's out this way 
and you have the magnitude. Remember our magnitude system counts backward. So the graph we gave you in the lab book for you to use, if you want to use a paper graph out of the lab book, uh, looks like it counts backwards. It has, you know, highest, uh, the smallest number up here, the highest number down here. It counts down that direction because one is brighter than 10 and so on. So um, this is, and if you want to, so, so if you want to use the graph paper that's in the, the lab book, uh, great. Uh, if you want to use your own lab paper, great. If you want to plot this on the computer, great. Uh, I would I would recommend plotting it on the computer if you have access to software to do that. Um, I use a code often. We use MATLAB or Kaleidograph to do that around here. Um, for making graphs that we can play around with, I like Kaleidograph a lot. It's got to get a bit a little bit old. Most people use something else these days, I think. Uh, but it's a great software to do that. Excel will do that to a certain degree. Whatever you have access to, uh, you want to do this. And you want to plot this. You'll see something that looks like this. Okay. And what we, one of the things I've suggested, so you want to explore this. Try to find out where the peak was. We might not have data on the night of the peak. So you might have to fit a curve. You can fit a smooth curve by hand. Or if you're using the computer, you can take those data points out and just plot those data points and say, hey, computer, hey, Excel, hey, Kaleidograph, hey, MATLAB, I want you to fit a parabola to that, a second order polynomial or something along those lines and use the fit to determine where the peak is. OK, if that's one of your learning goals, remember, we're back to thinking about different learning goals that can come from this exercise. If one of your learning goals is to think about manipulating data and doing things like finding peaks and practice fitting curves, great, you can do that. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's probably worth at least drawing a curve, smooth curve by hand and trying to estimate by eye over here what the peak magnitude was. So then you can take that and say, OK, if this is your peak apparent magnitude, let's convert that to an absolute magnitude um, by thinking about what the distance is to the, the large Magellanic cloud there where this thing blew up. So uh, anyway, uh, you could also fit your curve down here. And I recommend that in the exercise to say fit the curve here, fit the curve here, and say what's the, what's the slope? What's the slope if you fit a line? It's probably not linearly. Uh, da this data is probably not linearly related to this data, but you can get a sense of the trend by fitting a line to a narrow segment or a line to the narrow segment and say, so how fast was this, the supernova getting fainter? How quickly was it getting fainter in this region versus this region? What was happening? How was it evolving over time? That could be your research question. That could be the thing that you want to understand. We, we talk about how we would think of that as a knee. You can think about, look for knees in this uh, light curve to say this is where that slope changes. It's an inflection point is really what it is. It's a point where you have one slope, uh, you have one rate of change of how bright the, the supernova is, and it changes to a different rate of change. And so you can look for those and try to identify those in your data. And you can, again, do that. You let the computer do that with a fit. If you want to do that, if, you're, if that's what you're about, and you want to do that, you can do that on paper with uh, the graph that you make by hand and look for that that way. So identify however many knees you have in there. And probably something physically different is going on in the supernova. We know something physically different is going on in the supernova. If you think about that energy, that where's the energy? Ask yourself, where's the energy coming from to power the luminosity, to power the brightness of this supernova? And we know that it's the radioactive decay of various isotopes. And those things have different half-lives. And so those things are going to have different amounts of you know, some some things that have longer half-lives might power this at, at longer times like this. But, you know, it might actually turn the other way. And then either, what the heck's going on there? And there might be something else that's going on there. Um, and so you can th start to think about, build a physical model of what's going on with the supernova system to say, why did, would it change shape like that? And what might be happening? So that's that's a great, uh, a great thing for you to practice with this exercise as well. And... Um, so, so you go in, look for those, fit those, put the error bars on here if you want, see what it looks like when it starts, see how long, see, you know, one of the questions we ask at the end of the exercise is to say, you know, how quickly did it get from where it started to peak and then back down to the same brightness where it started? Was it getting brighter faster than it was getting fainter or was it getting brighter more slowly than it was getting uh, fainter after this. So these are all things that you could do. If you wanted to go in a completely different direction, and, and I wholeheartedly endorse this as well, uh, there is a, a website out there, and I popped it up. It's sne.space. You can go to sne.space, and that's a repository for all kinds of 
different supernova data sets. Um, and so you can go there and you can find data from 15 different supernovae, and that would be a fun project. Plot them all. Plot the, plot the light curves like this of all these supernovae and look for variations. How much do they vary one from the next? And what do they, what do they look like? Can you find two supernovae or three supernovae from the same uh, galaxy? And if you can find it from the same galaxy, then can you estimate the distance? How, what distances do they give you to that galaxy, and how close are they to one another? And that's a, you know that would be a super semester-long project to think about undertaking uh, as part of the course, or three-week project to think about uh, expanding this. Do this, do this in lab one week, and then for the next two weeks or three weeks, go explore SNE dot space and, and and look at those supernova data and see if you can can understand the variety of supernova. So there's a lot you can squeeze out of this exercise. Uh, it looks, it is really, it's from the relatively simple where you just take a, a data that's in a table and plot it up. And again, if you're plotting this by hand and you don't want to plot all those points that are in there, omit some of those points. It's, you know, it's, it's choose your own adventure kind of thing. Uh, you can admit, omit some of the points. Uh, it, you're going to see this shape a lot better if you, if you include all those points. Uh, and so you're going to see what's going on. But you can do all of that uh, from the relatively simple to take a data set, plot it, and then ask questions about the shape and ask questions about the, the peak brightness and so on to the relatively complex to think about statistics if that's what you're into to thinking about turning it into a project to compare it to other supernovae that are out there. So this is a, a wonderful exercise that can go in a lot of different directions. It's special to me. Uh, I don't, you know, I won't age myself too much here except that I will. Uh, I was a senior at university, a senior in college at Indiana University in 1987. So I was about to graduate and go on to graduate school uh, when this supernova occurred. It was a big deal. I was working at the Indiana University Cyclotron facility at that time. Uh, with getting a wonderful experience, and, and we got to go. So we were working on uh, isospin in in nuclei. Um, we, we don't have time to get into that right now, uh, but it was a great project for an undergraduate. I got to get some really good experience, and, and my advisor, Les Bland, uh, thank you very much for that experience. And he, he took us to uh, the nuclear science uh, meeting in Washington, D.C. that year uh, in, in April. And so that was two months after this uh, after the supernova. And the buzz that was on the floor as a young person entering science, the buzz, there were, there were special sessions set up, you know, there were the sessions people had written papers and submitted abstracts to and you went to during the day. But at night, as, as we were learning more every day about this supernova and, and the nuclear decays that might be powering this and the nuclei that might have been formed and this, the nuclear physics that was going on in there, all these nuclear physicists gathered there at this meeting, the, 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 the excitement was palpable. You can sometimes, it, it, it's what science is and it's what science should be where everyone was just plain excited to hear what was happening on a daily basis. What do we know today that we didn't know yesterday that we didn't know? It was energizing. It was just a super experience and, and, and again, um, I, I thank my advisor, Les Bland, for allowing that to happen and, and, and making me part of that experience early on that helped direct me here. So I, I, it's fun to think about that. I went uh, to look, I went, I was on graduate school tours, uh, thinking about where I was going to go to graduate school. And I had an opportunity to talk to, to Larry Sulak there, who had been part of one of the experiments, the IMB experiment that detected neutrinos for the first time from outside the solar system. And it was a proton decay experiment. We read about that just a little bit in the textbook. And so it was it was fun to be able to sit in his office and talk to him about that uh, just, just a couple of months again, after a month even, after that supernova had occurred. Um, and they had detected those neutrinos. So it was just, a, it was a great time and it was a great experience. And so every time I look back at this Supernova 1987A exercise, it takes me back and reminds me of sort of where I came from. I hope you have a good experience with it and take it in whatever direction that is most meaningful for you. Thanks everybody. Good luck with it. We'll have more for you on other exercises.